This is a 2002 Mercedes-Benz SL500 Silver Arrow, and it is the last old-school Mercedes-Benz. Now, this body style of the SL was sold from 1989 all the way through 2002 before giving way to a new model with a more mainstream design and a cheaper interior with lower quality plastics. But this is an excellent example of one of the very last SL models built before that change. And today, I'm going to review it. First, a little overview. Now, enthusiasts refer to this era of the SL as the R129 model, and it is the best modern SL by far. It was a better car than the one that came after it, which didn't have the impressive quality of this car. And while Mercedes-Benz quality has improved in recent years, the SL has morphed into a relaxed luxury cruiser for old men to take to the golf course. This was the last SL that really set the tone for the entire Mercedes-Benz lineup. Now, like I mentioned, this version of the SL came out in 1989. Its first model year here in North America was 1990, and the original models were offered with a choice between a six-cylinder or a V8 engine. If you chose the six-cylinder, you could opt for a manual transmission, which is hard to believe given the status of the SL today. Now, in 1993, they added a V12 version, and over the years, they tweaked the styling and improved the interior and they kept this thing going for an amazing 13 years, even as the rest of the Mercedes lineup started to adopt this more mainstream rounded look that the SL itself would eventually get in 2003. But before that happened, there was this, the SL500 Silver Arrow, which were some of the very last SL models built on this body style in 2002 before Mercedes-Benz switched to the next one. Now, Mercedes made around 1,500 of these Silver Arrow models for North America. Most had the V8, like this car, but a handful had the V12, and it was the swan song of this body style. And today, silver aero models like this one are among the most valuable SL models from this body style, assuming you can find one in excellent shape, like this car. So today I'm going to take you on a tour of the SL500 Silver Aero, and I'm going to show you all of its interesting quirks and features, then I'm going to get it out on the road and drive it, and then I'm going to give it a Doug score. And for more of my thoughts on the Silver Aero, click the link below to visit autotrader.com slash oversteer, where I've also rounded up a list of some of the best preserved older Mercedes-Benz models currently listed for sale on Autotrader. All right, I'm going to start the quirks and features of the Silver Arrow by going over a few things that distinguished the Silver Arrow from the regular SL from this era. One of those things was the wheels. This particular wheel design with these little rivets was unique to the Silver Arrow models, and back in the day, it was one of the easy ways you could tell apart a Silver Arrow from another SL. Of course, these days, people swap wheels, so it's not such a surefire thing, but these wheels are still mostly on the Silver Arrow models. You also have a little fender badge here that's says SL in the middle and then silver arrow on either side to remind you that you're one of the lucky few with one of the last SL models. And next up, moving on to the interior of this SL, there are a couple of other silver arrow touches in here. One is on the door sill. When you open the door, you can see again it says SL silver arrow in that same badge as you saw on the fender. But the most obvious interior difference of the silver arrow models came to the interior as a whole, where the silver arrow models got this special two two-tone interior that was like silver and black. And you can see the seats are this two-tone. The middle is silver and the outside is black. Same deal with the steering wheel. It's this whitish silver and black. The door panels also have this sort of off-white cream silver and black. And the floor mats have this whitish silver trim along with black. That was the entire interior of the Silver Arrow models. So you might be wondering, what exactly is Silver Arrow anyway? What does that mean? Well, apparently it was a race car 
car that Mercedes-Benz was making in the 30s, and it was a very successful race car, and so they've used that name on a few other racing models since. But this particular car was named after the 1930s version, and you can tell that because there's a little silver arrow badge in the center control stack on the ashtray lid, and it has the silhouette of that 1930s race car in the badge, and it's the same deal on the seat back. So you can see it says Silver Arrow, and again you have the silhouette of the actual Silver Arrow race car from the 1930s. But anyway, moving on to the other interesting quirks and features of the SL, probably the most interesting is the roll bar. Now, in a modern convertible, if you roll over, the roll bar is usually integrated into the deck lid, and it automatically shoots out when it detects a rollover to keep your head from getting smushed with the car upside down. But in this car, the roll bar was all your choice. This little button here in the center console, you can see it flips two ways. Well, if you press it up, the roll bar in back automatically power folds into the up position. If you press this little switch down, the roll bar automatically power folds back down. Now, when the car has the roll bar down, obviously it looks nicer. It's a better look for this car, but with the roll bar up, it's safer. So when you were driving your SL, you had to make the decision, do you want safety or style? And then you would choose exactly how you wanted your roll bar positioned as you drove around. Now, next up, speaking of the roll bar, I want to talk about the area with the roll bar and specifically accessing it because it's rather unusual. If you look on the sides of the seats, you can see there's a chrome like door handle there. If you pull that door handle, the seat back will go forward and then you can access the area behind the seats. I've seen a lot of plastic latches, power buttons, but I've never really seen a door handle in that spot. Now, once you get behind the seats, you can see that this is just a carpeted little storage area. None of the SL models from this era were four seaters, even though you could stick two very, very small seats in there. Mercedes-Benz never did. So that area is just kind of, you can put whatever you want back there for storage. Now, next up, another important thing back there is of course the roof. That's where it's stowed when it's down, like now. And obviously you can put it up. And one cool thing about this car was it had a fully power convertible convertible top, which was unusual for the period. Most cars, you had to at least unlatch something at the windshield, but not in the SL. It would do it all automatically. But there was a weird thing about it, and that was specifically how loud it was when it was unlatching all of the stuff. Take a listen to the top going down. But the most interesting thing about the convertible top in this car is undoubtedly the top button. It's right here in the center console and it is shaped like the roof of the SL. You can see the back part is the back window. You have the side windows, then you can see the pillars and the roof part. It is actually a top button shaped like the top. I love that. I think that's absolutely brilliant. And if you want the top to go down, you just pull on that button and then it goes down. And since I know how much you people like to watch that, well, here you go. Now, one interesting thing about the top situation in this car is that that wasn't the only top. When the SLs were sold, that top was included, of course, but also included was a removable hardtop painted in the color of the body. Now, the problem with the removable hardtop is it is absolutely massive. Take a look at it. You can see it's huge. It has three windows in it. It has a heater for the rear window, and it is insanely large. In fact, it's so large that it's kind of one of those twice a year things. You put on the hardtop for winter, you take it off for spring, and you never touch it otherwise. And I especially say that because just getting it on or off is a two-person job. Take a look. Now, next up, moving beyond the tops and the roll bar, I want to move on to the other quirks and features of this SL, starting with the climate controls, and specifically the fact that the climate control screen currently says smog on it. There it is. You can see smog is printed. Why is this? I don't know. <laughs> 
I have no idea why that could possibly be on there. Maybe it detects smog, but, but even then, what do I do with that information? Either way, it says that currently. Now, next up, another cool quirk of this SL is some of its luxurious interior trim. Take a look around the gauge cluster. You can see this gorgeous, like, aluminum pattern trim, like a vintage aircraft. And you have the very same trim around the gear lever. You can see it looks a lot better than the plastic or even the wood that Mercedes-Benz uses in other cars. I think that trim is unique to the Silver Arrow model, and it looks really, really nice. It gives it a very modern, updated, gorgeous look. Now, next up, speaking of the trim in this car, one other trim item that I absolutely love is in the floor mats. If you look down there, you can see it says SL, and it's finished in this really nice metal. Not a cheap plastic, not some cheaply stitched thing on there, but a real metal badge in the floor mat, which I think gives it a really nice, distinguished, upscale look. And next up, another interesting item. If you turn on the radio in this SL, you can see that the power antenna goes up on the trunk. This was common in 90s cars, but by 2002, most cars had done away with it. But obviously, this SL had a pretty old design, so it still kept it. The benefit was, as you can see, the power antenna didn't really go up all that far. It's not some ridiculous thing like most 90s cars, but it does go up. Now, next up, moving back to the gauge cluster, you can see there are five full circle gauges in here, which makes for kind of an excess gauge situation. What do you do with five gauges? Well, Mercedes got a little creative. The one on the far right is just a clock. There's no analog clock in the center of this car. Instead, it's in the gauge cluster next to the tachometer. Interestingly, the gauge all the way over on the left is the fuel gauge, and it is very large. It's a full circle gauge just for the fuel. I find that to be kind of interesting, unlike the temperature of the oil gauges next to it, which are only like a small part of the gauge, that fuel gauge is the whole thing, so you can really tell precisely how much fuel you have left at any given moment. Now, next up, like the antenna in back, one other item that kind of shows this car's age is the airbag situation. Now, midway through this car's production run, airbags became mandatory. And so Mercedes stuck an airbag in the dashboard like everybody else did. The problem was that got rid of the glove box. So Mercedes had to get a little creative with their storage options. One example of this creativity, there's a little storage panel above the center climate controls. You push this little arrow button it pops open and then you can stick some stuff in that little hidden compartment. You can also lock that compartment if you want, which is pretty impressive. But obviously that compartment isn't as big as a glove box, so Mercedes had to do some other creative storage solutions as well. One of them is the center console, which is a nice big storage area, and you can see it has these retractable cup holders. So rather than just take up this space with cup holders, Mercedes made the cup holders retractable so you could use it for storage or for cups, depending on what you wanted, which is a good idea. But the best storage solution is in the door panels. You have these door pockets that actually fold open or closed. You can put stuff in them or take it out, and you can hide it to kind of keep it away from people. And another interesting storage spot in this car came behind the seats in that little carpeted area. There are actually storage compartments in there. If you look behind the seats, you can see there's a little red latch. If you push it, you can open up the bottom part of the carpeted area. Over on the driver's side, there's some stereo equipment over there. But over on the passenger side, there was a little compartment for cargo, whatever you wanted to put there, again, to kind of make up for not having a glove box. And by the way, one other interesting item in the center console here, you can see this little decal next to the gear lever. It says, press brake pedal to shift from P, etc. That decal is factory original. You do not want to buy an SL from this era without that decal. If it's on there, it shows pride of ownership. And finally, one other interesting item in the center console area in the SL is the center armrest. If you push this little square plastic tab at the front of the center armrest, it will go forward and then you can put your arm on it and it will adjust to exactly where you want your arm to be for maximum comfort. And next up, another interesting interior item in this car is the seat controls. Now, they're mounted on the doors like they are on most Mercedes-Benz models, but the interesting thing here is the headrest control. There's a separate button you can use to raise or lower the headrest. Now, several Mercedes models have this. The cool thing here is when you raise the headrest, the seat belt also raises with it. And when you lower the headrest, same deal, the seat belt goes down too. I guess the car figures if you're taller, you're raising the headrest, so you'll need the seat belt to be taller to accommodate you too. It's a good idea. And next up, moving on to the outside of the SL, I want to talk about its styling. Now, it's no secret that I like Mercedes-Benz vehicles. I own one now, and I've had a few. And I think there was a period in the 2000s where they kind of went off track and they weren't making the greatest cars. But this, 
this thing was so good. It was well put together, but it also just looked so good. It was not overstyled. It was not excessive. It was just kind of the perfect boxy, purposeful look. And they then went to the rounded stuff and the circle headlights, but I always just thought the squared off kind of understated but luxurious nature of this car was so so perfect. Mercedes got this thing just right. I especially liked the later models like this one with one single color. Some of the early ones were weird two-tone colors and this little flared rocker panel that kind of does a twist on the side which gave it a sporty look. I felt this was kind of the pinnacle of design of this era of Mercedes-Benz. And next up, we move on to the SL's trunk, where there are a few interesting items, starting with just unlocking the trunk. This car has keyless entry, which was rare in 2002, although getting more common. And it operates in an unusual way. When you press the lock button, each lock does its thing individually. So you press unlock, and one door, then another door, then the fuel door, and then the trunk, and you can actually hear them all. I'm not sure if I'll be able to capture it on camera, but take a look. Okay, it's currently locked and... All right, now lock. Unlock. And lock. How weird. Moving on from that to get into the trunk, you unlock it, you push this little trunk button and then it pops open. And there are a couple of interesting items in here. The trunk itself does not look particularly interesting or special, and in fact it is not, but there's a little hidden compartment on the front half of the trunk near to the passenger compartment, and that stores the wind deflector. Now, modern SL models have a power wind deflector. You push a button and it pops up, but in this thing it was manual. You had to put it on yourself, and that's where you could store it when you weren't using it. Other interesting items in here, you have a toolkit with various Mercedes-Benz tools. You can see these are in great shape. And finally, getting under the hood and onto the engine. Now, getting under the hood starts simple enough. You just pull a little latch in the driver's footwell like basically every other car. But then it's kind of odd. I went searching for the latch to actually open it, and I couldn't find it up here. It turns out it's hidden inside the Mercedes-Benz emblem, below where the three points in the star meet. There's a hidden little tab. You pull that, and then you can open up the hood, and you can access the engine of your SL. And once you're under the hood and looking at the engine, you notice two things right away. First off, it is clean. The owner of this car cleaned it up really, really nicely, but it's not just that. This car is in really, really nice shape. Only about 60,000 miles and 17 years. It's really impressive, and this is probably not too different from how this engine would have looked from the factory. But the other thing you notice under here is this engine is big. This is a 5-liter V8, 300 horsepower. And there's none of that twin-turbo V6 stuff that you get in modern cars nowadays. Fuel economy wasn't as big of a concern back then, so this thing just has a giant old school V8 and it shows. And so those are the quirks and features of the 2002 Mercedes-Benz SL500 Silver Arrow. Now it's time to get it out on the road and see how it drives. All right, driving the SL. Now one thing that's worth noting about this car that I think a lot of younger people watching maybe don't realize is when this car was on sale new, it was the fastest, sportiest, coolest Mercedes you could get. This was before the SLS, this was before the SLR, it was before the AMG GT. This is where the Mercedes-Benz lineup stopped and AMG wasn't even really a big player at this time. Uh, most of the Mercedes models had not been AMG-ified. And so this thing was ultra, ultra, ultra cool and it had more of a true performance credential than the modern SL does. Now driving that point home is the fact that some of Mercedes' earliest AMG models were on this SL body style. They made an SL73 with the 7.3 liter engine that was later used in the Pagani Zonda V12, uh, but that never came to North America. And so as far as the North American cars go, uh, the Silver Arrow and some of the later SL600 V12 models are the most desirable. Now, as for how this drives, it is surprisingly quick. It's actually a lot of fun. Uh, when, you, when you really put your foot down, it can go. It's also relatively composed in corners. It's not incredibly sharp, but it's better than you might expect. Um, it definitely didn't have the sort of relaxed cruiser image quite uh, at this time that the SL does now because this car had to kind of be everything to all people at the top of the Mercedes-Benz range, and that meant it really had to be a good flagship car and a sporty car. One interesting thing I noticed about this SL is it feels low, very low. 
Um, the window line is very low. The car itself is low. Cars have just gotten so much bigger so fast. You know, this was only 15 years ago, but it, it doesn't even feel, it's crazy how much lower it feels than a, than a modern car. The sporting pretensions are there. It does feel a little bit on the sporty side, more than I was expecting. It's a little bit quicker than I thought it would be. It's quicker to downshift. And then the handling is, is better than I thought. It's not as floaty and terrible as I was expecting. I'm actually surprised by that. But um, what it really is best at, nonetheless, is being on just a high quality car. It feels smooth, it feels solid, it feels well built, it feels quiet. It just feels like, I mean, this thing's 17 years old, it feels like it could easily last another 17. It really feels like they were building this knowing that these would become collectible because that's what happened to the Pagoda and that's what happened to the Gullwing. And they know the SL is the one people want. And so they like, it's almost like they put extra effort into making sure this car would last a while. Although I personally would argue that was kind of how all Mercedes models were in the 80s and 90s and they strayed from that in the 2000s and early 2010s and they're only kind of coming back to that now with really high quality top of the charts vehicles. The car also feels small, surprisingly little, um, which adds to kind of the fun feel. I mean, it certainly doesn't feel like a Miata, but it's a low, small, you know, the, the window line is low, it's, it's a two-seater, it's tight. It's surprisingly, it's closer to that than you might think because it's an SL. You know, newer SLs just feel bigger and more touringer and uh, th this, this is actually more fun. And so that's the 2002 Mercedes-Benz SL500 Silver Arrow. This isn't the fastest car I've reviewed, nor is it the most exciting or the most amazing, but it is a special car. The very last Mercedes SL before the SL began its downward spiral towards undesirability. This is a cool car when it's in nice shape and the Silver Arrow is the coolest of them all. And now it's time to give this SL a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, this era of SL was impressive and it gets a 7 out of 10. Acceleration to 0 to 60 in 5.8 seconds and it gets a 4 out of 10. Handling is good, sharper than I was expecting, but not too precise or excessively sporty and it gets a 5 out of 10. Fun factor is decent, it's still a relatively relaxed automatic car, but it is a relatively powerful convertible and it gets a 5 5 out of 10. Finally, cool factor, and I think these are cool, but they made a lot of them over 14 years, and they haven't yet hit collectible status, so it gets a 5 out of 10 for a total weekend score of 26 out of 50. Next up are the daily categories and features. It's got good tech for its era, but of course it comes up a bit short by modern standards, and it gets a 4 out of 10. Comfort is fine, better than average for sure, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Quality is excellent, as these came from one of Mercedes' best eras, and it gets an 8 out of 10. Practicality is normal for a two-seater convertible, and it gets a 3 out of 10. Finally, value, and I happen to think these are great values. SL models from this era are shockingly cheap in the $15,000 range for like the very nicest examples, and I do think they'll eventually go up in value. It gets a 7 out of 10 for a total daily score of 28 out of 50. Added up in the Doug score is 54 out of 100, which places it here against other sports cars and luxury cars from this era. The SL does well, beating out most as it was a great car, a relatively sporty, relatively relatively comfortable, attractive car from a great era. This was the very last really good Mercedes SL. Hey!